أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يطع الله والرسول فأولئك مع الذين أنعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyu al-azim, for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, for the acceptance of the deeds, and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, ajallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif, enlighten your souls, purify your hearts, and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected elders, Dear sisters and brothers in Islam, Salamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. This individual was the daughter of an Imam. She was also the wife of another Imam. She is also the mother of another Imam. And she is the grandmother of another Imam. She has a name that was beloved to the Ahl al-Bayt and her life and legacy constitutes an important example and she is a brilliant role model for both men and women. Fatima bint al-Hasan is the daughter of Imam al-Mujtaba and the wife of Imam al-Sajjad and the mother of Imam al-Baqir and the grandmother of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim ajma'in. Fatima, the daughter of the second holy Imam, is an exceptional personality and an individual whose life deserves to be studied and analyzed for a number of reasons. For we recognize that she is unique in that she is related to so many of the members of the Ahl al-Bayt in such a brilliant manner. She is also amongst a group of people who unfortunately we have not shed light upon sufficiently and have not studied their legacies as much as they deserve. The Holy Quran comes forward and makes a distinction between the wives of the Ma'sumin and the mothers of the Ma'sumin. The wives of the Ma'sumin do not all have to be righteous, but the ma mothers of the Ma'sumin are all brilliant individuals. The Quran comes forward and gives us example of the wives of certain prophets, such as Nuh and Lut. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَمْرَأَةَ Lut. Allah says, I give you this multitude to those who are disbelievers of the wife of Prophet Nuh and Prophet Lut. Yet when the Quran analyzes the mothers of these holy individuals, it does not speak other than praise. For example, you have the mother of Prophet, Isa, Prophet Musa, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah wa ta'ala, when he discusses Musa, he talks about her, his mother to be an individual who received revelation or at least some kind of intuition, ilham, into her heart. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ Quran says, we reveal to the mother of Moses that suckle him. And of course, later the Quran also describes her as one of the 
believers come to Prophet Ismail, his mother Hajar, praised in the Quran as an individual who what? Who dedicated herself to God, who sacrificed. And Allah today has made the actions of millions of human beings in the footsteps of a mother of a ma'soom in Hajj. And this is something that you and I practice, isn't it? When we walk between Safa and Marwa, seven times we are emulating Hajar, salamullahi alayha. Come to Maryam, Maryam, the mother of Prophet Isa, ala nabina wa ala alihi wa alayhi afdal salatu wa salam. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, wa idh qalat al malaikatu ya Maryam, inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa al alameen. Allah says, the malaika, the angel said to Mary, O oh Mary, Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you over the people of the worlds, meaning the people at that time. These are examples of wonderful individuals who are the mothers of righteous masumin, God chosen servants of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And without a shadow of a doubt, the mothers of the Imams indeed have a status that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Because the womb that carries a masum is a womb that is pure and righteous. A womb that ensures a ma'asum is nourish, nourished and nurtured is a womb chosen by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the mothers of the Imams alayhim salam need to be understood, I tell you today, as followers of Ali Muhammad. As follows of these wonderful individuals, if you and I were to be questioned and examined, tell me about the wife of Imam al sadiq or the mother rather of the sixth holy Imam. Tell me about the mother of the eleventh Imam. Tell me about the mother of the fifth Imam. How many of us will be able to come forward and confidently speak about these individuals? Let alone mention their names. In the realization that in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, an important quality that exists within the followers of these holy, error-free, sinless individuals is mawadda, isn't it? We always emphasize the need to explain and display degrees and statuses of love, loyalty, and association with these holy individuals. And I tell you, how much do you and I love the Ahl al-Bayt? It should be more than we love ourselves and our family members. And I ask you, if we are aware of the mothers of these holy Imams, how much love are we placing in the hearts of these holy Imams? If I love Imam al-Baqir and I know the mother of Imam al-Baqir and I praise the mother of Imam al-Baqir, this brings joy to the hearts of the fifth Imam, no doubt. And it indeed inspires me because mawadda in school of Ali Muhammad is not only an expression of emotion, it is also a demonstration of proximity to God and empowerment through the association with these holy individuals. It makes me a stronger individual when I display my love towards these holy people. And that's why it is of the utmost importance that some light is shed onto the lives of these holy individuals. Yes, we may not know much about their illustrious lives because of course, much of our history perhaps has been subject to attack, subject to fabrication, number one. Number two, women of the Ahl al-Bayt were generally protected. Women of the Ahl al-Bayt were not necessarily exposed. So in historical narrations and in records, you will not find detailed analysis of these ladies. That's why when it comes to the 10th of Muharram, there exists a great deal of confusion in the minds of so many people regarding the very personality of the women of the Ahl al-Bayt that were there on the day of Ashura. You hear some people talk about, for example, a lady by the name of Ruqayya, a young child. Others speak about Sakina. Others come forward and say there is a Sukaina. What's the difference between this individual and the other? Yes, Alhamdulillah, ulama have investigated and published number of works in order to decipher and to give us a clear idea of who's who. But at the same time, we cannot be absolutely sure because of the fact that these ladies were indeed protected because 
of whom they are and because of what they stood to indeed symbolize. Yet at the same time we have sufficient information to shed light into their legacy and what they stood to achieve. But also significantly why I should know a little bit about Fatima bint al-Hasan and other great individuals such as whom? Such as Fatima bint al-Qasim. Who's Fatima bint al-Qasim? She's known as Umm Farwa. She's the mother of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And do you know what is so interesting about these holy individuals, the mothers of the Ma'asumin, the mothers of the Imams? A number of them have been praised by whom? The Imams themselves. The Imams do not praise a human being except that they're worthy of praise because their speech is proof for every human being. They will not do so out of emotion. They will not express this because this individual happens to be their mother. It is because they deserve due to their actions. Fatima bint al-Qasim is known as Umm Farwa. She was one of the greatest ladies of her time. She was amongst the most knowledgeable of the people of her time. In that, she used to be a person who would respond to the questions and would answer the queries of the people. She was a jurist. In Medina, the sixth Imam says, that whom that my mother and as well as that my wife would be sent to medina in order to answer the questions of people men and women such was the status of umm farwa ta'ala and the sixth imam says kanat ummi mimman amanat wa attaqat wa ahsanat wallahu yuhibbu al muhsinin imam al sadiq says my mother let me tell you about her this is an al kafi she was amongst those who was the best of the believers, the best of the God conscious, and the best who did good in society. Because Allah loves those who do good. She was an exceptional person. Then you have another person who is the mother of the 11th holy Imam. Her name is Sumana. This particular lady, a lot of people don't know, but she had a tremendous role in the protection of the awaited Savior, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajjalallahu ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. When the Imam alayhi salam perhaps was one or two years of age, Imam al Askari alayhi salam said to his mother, I want you to take him, according to a number of reports, according to some of our ulama that have discussed this narration, Imam al Askari says that I want you to take him and go to Mecca, go to that area away from Surram and Ra'a, Samar Ra, because of the increasing tension and the constant watchful eyes of Bani Abbas because they recognized that there will be a 12th leader from amongst those Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt who would lead this movement against tyranny and injustice. And therefore, it was very difficult. So some narration says this lady, the mother of Imam al-Askari, took the holy 12th Imam towards Mecca and Medina and looked after him until the Imam السلام, the 11th Imam asked her to return back to Samarra and she returned only a short while before the martyrdom of Imam al-Askari. These are examples of these holy ladies. But at the same time when we discuss the status of the mothers of the Imams, we are honoring and reinforcing what the religion comes forward to talk about when it comes to the status of our own mothers, no doubt. Because how many of us have come across narrations from, for example, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That speaks so highly of how the religion looks at mothers. And I tell you, often when I speak about how Islam discusses mothers, many fathers feel uncomfortable. They feel it's like a competition. If you speak well about the mothers, throw in something about the fathers. Otherwise, we will not hear the end of it back home after Majlis. Some say, yes. Otherwise, we will not ever be able to reconcile. The idea that emerges though, however, and to be truthful as much as we possibly can and understand from the member of Rasulullah, the status of mothers in Islam is higher than that of fathers, no doubt. No doubt. There is no try and, you know, attempts to try and somehow be diplomatic 
and say 50-50 and so on and so forth. Because I tell you, how do you explain narrations that someone comes to the Holy Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, I have my father and I have my mother whom I should look after more. He says, your mother. He says, next, your mother. Next, your mother. Then, your father. Is this 50-50? Another narration in our books that is found and is sound, the holy messenger of God says to someone, if you're praying salah, which is mustahab, and your mother, not wajib, and your mother calls you, break the salah and respond to your mother. But if your father calls you, don't break the salah. No doubt. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is not making a status of the father insignificant in Islam because, of course, the fourth holy imam speaks about the importance of the haq of the father as well when it comes to risalatul huquq as well as the mother. The religion of Islam highlights that both need to be importantly active in the upbringing of the children. Yet there is an emphasis upon mothers which is very unique, no doubt. And some people ask the question, why? Why so much emphasis upon the mother and today actually scientific research has shown an important element about mothers which perhaps people of the past other than the masumin did not know what is that today we know when a lady is pregnant what she eats what she listens to what she does has an impact on the fetus no doubt if she's stressed maybe this will somehow have an impact on the baby that she's carrying but today, scientific research has gone even further. A study in the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom looked at 8,000 children and their mother and their father over the 90s. This is a big study. And the results are very revealing and interesting. What they saw is that when it comes to mothers, before they were pregnant, if they had some issues to do with mental health, if they suffered with anxiety or depression, there is a statistically significant impact that they would have upon their children that the more the mother suffered with these kind of traits, the more likelihood that their children will also do so later on in life more than their peers. So now what they did was, in order to scientifically prove this, they'd had to also study those individuals who had fathers who had these kind of traits as well. They studied that and statistically they showed that even though those individuals who had their fathers with these traits, it is still more scientifically sound to say that the characteristics are more likely to be passed on through the mother than the father. And this is indeed something that supports Islamic teachings. Notice the wording. Not Islamic teachings support it. There's a difference, yes? That these kind of research support what traditions in the religion of Islam have come forward to establish. The messenger of God comes forward in a narration. Listen to this narration. He says, اختاروا لنطفكم فإن العرقد الساس He says, choose carefully when you're about to get married because qualities or characteristics are inherited through the womb yes these are very key now i ask you to reflect upon this very important incident in history and that is where, where in the battle of safin amir al-mu'mineen wa imam al-muttaqeen ali ibn abi talib salawatullahi wa salam alayhi had a son by the name of Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. It was his own son brought from his wife who was Khawla bint Ja'far. Khawla bint Ja'far was the wife of Amir al Mu'mineen. And uh, indeed, a son was born known as Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, Radwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, an exceptional individual who is not there on the 10th of Muharram, yet we believe he was a righteous individual, no doubt, a scholar in his own right, and was the link between Imam al Sajjad and Mukhtar al Thaqafi. That indeed, Mukhtar al Thaqafi would launch his revolution in support of whom Imam al Sajjad, but through directions given from Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. Anyway, Muhammad ibn Hanafi on the day of Safin emerged to the battlefield. Amir al-Mu'mineen said to him, go, march. 
Muhammad ibn Hafiyah went a little bit forward, then the arrows were showered upon him. So what did he do? He retracted. He came back. Amir al-Mu'mineen said a famous line. He said, Adraka, what? Adraka arqa ummih. He returned back because of the traits from his mother. Because at the same time, there was Hassan and Hussein who never retracted in the battlefield. Yes, the father is still the same, but the mother is different. Yes, Muhammad ibn Hanafiyyah came back. Incidentally, Muhammad ibn Hanafiyyah was not, God forbid, any person who was afraid in the battlefield. In fact, he was marching towards the, uh, the battlefield with valor and conviction. And they came forward and said, what are you doing? Why are you marching ahead of Hassan and Hussein, your own brothers? Yes, he said that Hassan and Hussein are what? My eyes. And I am, what, the arms. And it's the, the responsibility of the arms to protect the eyes. Somebody else said, but uh, why? Why are you doing this? He said, Hassan and Hussein are the sons of Rasulullah. I am the son of Ali. It is the responsibility of the son of Ali to protect the sons of Rasulullah. Yes. This was what? The statement from Muhammad al-Hanafiyyah. Yet at the same time, those instances where he retracted, there is what? There is a problem there. And that's due to what? Due to his own mother. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen looks at Aqil and says, Find me a wife that will give me a son who will protect my son Hussein on the land of Karbala. Amir al-Mu'mineen wants a wife who will produce in addition from the genes that comes from Amir al-Mu'mineen a son like Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. No doubt. Yes, Umm al-Baneen al-Kilabiyya Fatima bint Hizam, Radwanullahi ta'ala alayha, whom absolutely it's a matter of unbelievable privilege who, who, uh, uh, that she is my great-grandmother. We are from the same tribe of Bani Kilab, yes? That Umm al-Baneen, Radwanullahi ta'ala alayha, would have these characteristics of courage and valor that Amir al-Mu'mineen sought. That's why. When we study the biography of the mothers of the Ma'sumin, they must have these wonderful characteristics. Because a man like Ja'far al-Sadiq, or an individual like Ali al-Rida, or a person like Ali al-Hadi al-Naqi, would not emerge just because of their father, but also because the brilliance of their mother. That is established. Then when we come to Ziyarat Warith, what do we recite? Ashhadu annaka kunta nooran fil aslabil shamiqa. What does that mean? Wal arhamil mutahara. I bear witness that you, Ya Aba Abdullah, was as a light that passed through the loins that were great and the wombs that were pure. You pass through these from the prophets, yes, all the way. Towards the Lady of Light, Sayyidatun Nisa Fatima, Salawatullahi wa Salaamu Alayha. You look at this position of motherhood and you realize how wonderful it is that if our mothers are still alive, we appreciate what they have done for us, no doubt. You know, when you enter in a household and the mother is there, it's not the same when you go in and the mother is not there. And indeed, one of the ulama says, if your mother is still alive, hold on to her because she is a door towards Jannah. Doubt. Yes. When you recognize that Fatima bint al-Hasan was a great mother, she was a great wife. Indeed, she was a great daughter of all these ma'sumin and she's unique. But also what is great about Fatima, the daughter of Imam al-Mujtaba, is that she had a name that was beloved to Ali Muhammad in that the name Fatima meant something special to the Holy Ahl al-Bayt. In which way you recognize that Imam al-Hasan salam had a number of daughters. Narrations tell us he had seven daughters. Out of the seven daughters, three of the daughters were named Fatima. Some narration says three were named Fatima. Imam al-Hussein salam had a number of daughters. Some narrations say that a number of them were called Fatima. The seventh Imam, Musa ibn Ja'far, peace be upon him, had four daughters who were called Fatima. But I ask you, 
when you give the same name to four daughters, how do you distinguish between them? Normally in a household, people don't name more than one person with the same name. Notice how much they love this name that they would give it to four of their daughters. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said what? The first of my daughters is called Fatima al-Sughra. The second of my daughters is known as Fatima al-Wusta. The young Fatima. Then the second one, middle Fatima. The third is called Fatima al-Kubra. The fourth Fatima. I ask you, what is the fourth Fatima called? She was called Fatima al-Ukhra, the other Fatima. Notice the association with this glorious name because it meant so much to have the name Fatima in the household. Yes, no doubt. But this name Fatima, what does it mean? And who is it given to? Of course, the narrations come forward and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the giver of the name Fatima. In numerous of our narrations, we are told that, for example, the sixth holy imam would narrate that when the prophet of Islam, indeed, would narrate to people that when Adam, alayhi salam, when he was created, he saw lights close to the throne of Allah, metaphorically. And when he saw lights, he asked Allah, Ya Allah, have you created anything from clay before me? And Allah responded to him and says, no. I have not, but these lights that you see are my creation that will become from clay from your descendants. I, if it wasn't for them, I would not have created you. And if it wasn't for them, I would not have created the heavens and the earth. And if it wasn't for them, I would not have created the Kursi and the Arsh and Jannah and Jahannam. Why? Because I am Mahmud and the first is Muhammad, and I am A'la, and the second is Ali, and I am Fatir, and the third is Fatima, and I am Muhsin, and the third is Hassan, and I am Ihsan, and the fifth is Hussein. Indeed, the narrations come forward to investigate and to shed light on this glorious name of Fatima. Because Amir al muminin says that Fatima is a name that what? That denotes protection. The name Fatima is given to this holy lady because Allah has protected her and protected whomsoever loves her from Jahannam. Another narration says Fatima is a name that denotes protection from understanding her fully from appreciating whom exactly uh, this great lady and that's why the ahl al-bayt loved this name and encouraged the followers to name their children their daughters fatima i ask you what is the number one name given to female muslims around the world today it is certainly not fatima why what is the reason why individuals are naming their daughters after certain wives of the Prophet that stood against the Prophet and stood against the Ahl al-Bayt. Whereas the list, the whole, this holy lady and other great ladies of the Ahl al-Bayt that are respected by all Muslims are not as much named. Yes? And therefore, the recognition comes forward as the following, that we, as the followers of Ali Muhammad, are the ones whom we should be carrying this name with full conviction, with full certainty, no doubt, in every possible way. Fatima bint al-Hasan, the daughter of Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba, peace and blessings be upon them, was unique because she is the first individual who married, what? Somebody who is also Fatimi and Alawi, and she is Fatimi and Alawi, yes. In the idea that, of course, her grandfather is Amir al Mu'mineen and her grandmother is Sayyidatun Nisa Fatima. Peace and blessings be upon them. But we don't know of her exact date of birth. But what we do know is that she was married to the holy fourth Imam Zayn al Abidin al Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi.
at the age of 17, when the Imam was 17 years of age, he married Fatima. Now, what is interesting is that her mother, she was called Umm Ishaq Al-Tamimi. Umm Ishaq was the wife of Imam Al-Hasan and she was a brilliant person. Umm Ishaq was somebody whom Imam Al-Hasan loved dearly. And she was known amongst the most knowledgeable of the ladies of her time. She was so exceptional that Imam al Hassan alayhi salam made a will and said that I want my brother Imam al Hussein after my martyrdom to marry Umm Ishaq. After the waiting period ends, I want him to marry my wife Umm Ishaq because of her excellent qualities. And Umm Ishaq عليها, was there on the 10th of Muharram. She was present on the land of Karbala and she witnessed the tragedies alongside Fatima bint al Hassan as well. Yes, but the marriage, of course, happened before. And Imam Zain al Abidin married this righteous lady. In this wonderful household, on the first of Rajab in the year 50 after Hijrah, a young boy was born, Imam Muhammad al Baqir, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Narrations tell us that indeed the fifth Imam would say that my mother would tell me that when she was carrying me during pregnancy, she saw in a dream that she was revealed to and she was told that you are carrying one of the best people on this earth. So she recognized that the baby that she is indeed carrying is a special individual. Later, when she gave birth to Imam al-Baqir, Narrations tell us that Imam al-Baqir would tell us that, for example, in Al-Kafi it is found that he saw karamat, special miracles that his mother displayed. He says, I was sitting once, and this is where in Al-Kafi. I make special emphasis to mention the reference because I know some people will say, where did you bring this narration from? I don't be agree with this. This is weak. Where did This doesn't make sense. So I mention there as much as possible the source of these narrations so that people feel a little bit assured as to where the research has come and where the emphasis has been placed. So the Imam says that I saw that my mother was sitting and leaning on a wall and all of a sudden the wall began to collapse on my mother. But she looked at the wall and said, La wa haqqul Mustafa. No, I swear by the sake of Mustafa, the Holy Prophet, you have not been given permission by Allah to fall on me. He says, I saw, and the Imam says, I saw the wall suspended in the air until my mother moved away and then it fell. And then it fell. He says that this was something that made my father, Imam Zain al Abidin, pay some money out of for sadaqah, yes, pay some dinars for charity because, of course, because his beloved wife, Fatima, the daughter of Imam al Hassan, was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular way. In another narration, yes, Imam al Sajjad comes forward and says, What? He comes forward and describes his wife in a way which indeed is very unique. And this is a key aspect that requires your attention. What do we mean? The Quran comes forward and talks about a characteristic of a certain number of people which is higher than truthfulness. Sidq is a quality and a virtue that you and I love to possess. It is one that is praised in the Quran. How many times when you and I are somehow in a difficult position and we have kept something for a rainy day as the expression says for example some money we've kept on the side or we've stored some provisions in the car if we're stuck due to bad weather we turn to those provisions and say alhamdulillah i've kept this for example money somewhere hidden now i need it I need it when I'm in a difficult position because for example I've run out of money and I am in need of it at this particular time Allah Taala says the quality of Sidq is one that people on the day of Qiyamah will feel so pleased with because they will see the greatest benefit on that day because of its, bene of its beneficial impact. قال الله Quran says قال الله هذا يوم ينفع الصادقين صدقهم Allah says that on the day of Qiyamah it's where people will really see the impact of the Sidq 
the impact of the truthfulness. Now, there is a quality that is higher than Sidq, which the Quran speaks about. In chapter 4, verse number 69, Allah wa ta'ala gives us a wonderful example. He says, you want to be with the Prophet? You want to somehow be raised in their status? Because you know, today some people ask, can we be with Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt in Jannah? Are we able to somehow enjoy a status in paradise with these holy individuals? The notion that exists in the mindset of some people is that no, it's untouchable. It's something that cannot be fathomed. It's something that cannot be accepted. To be raised with them on the day of Qiyamah is beyond people's somehow understanding, isn't it? That is a notion that was shattered by Ali Muhammad, by the Holy Prophet himself. Somebody, one of his servants, one day came to him. And the Prophet said to him, you have served me such a long time. I want to reward you. I want to give you a gift. Tell me, what would you like? Imagine you were in the position of that person. That you've been blessed with an opportunity to ask Rasulullah to give you whatever you wish. And we know that the dua of the Messenger of God is answered by Allah. So he was smart, this particular servant of the Holy Prophet. And said to him, Ya Rasulullah, give me time to think about it. Because I tell you, some of us would have come forward and said all kinds of things. Can I have a massive house? Can I have this? Can I be the richest person? Can I attain this? In some countries, which I can't say, some may say, can I have a different president? Yes? Otherwise my visa will go. And so on and so forth. So the idea is what? The idea is people come hastily and ask for some hajat straight away. This man said, let me think about it. Came back next day. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm ready for my hajat. My gift from you. He said, yes, ask. What do you want? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't want anything except one thing. Just one thing from you. He said, what do you want? He said, I want you to ask Allah that on the day of Qiyamah in Jannah, I am with you exactly where you are. Wherever you are, I want to be with you. I ask you, is there anything better to ask for than this? You can ask for Jannah. But even much better is to ask to be with Rasulullah in Jannah. Now, imagine you were the messenger of God. What would you say? Most of them said, excuse me, I'm the greatest human being. I'm the final of the messengers. 124,000 prophets. I've endured so much hardship and difficulties. And you want to be with me in Jannah? That is what some of us would think, would have answered. Rasulullah though is Rasulullah. And he says to that man, don't worry, you can. But I want you to help me. He says, what do you mean? What should I do? He says, when you go in sajda, prolong your sajda. Yes, prolong your sajda so that this dua that I am asking Allah will be answered. Now, the Quran has come forward with this realization. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمَنْ يُطِعَ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ Anyone who obeys Allah and the Messenger. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ They will be from amongst those whom Allah has bestowed with favors and blessings. مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ Of the Prophets. وَالصَّدِّقِينَ The special elite truthful ones. وَالشُّهَدَاء The witnesses والصالحين, And the righteous وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقَ And they have the best companionship. Allah says in the Quran, you can be. You've just got to obey God and His Messenger. Of course, no doubt some people will say obedience to Allah and His Messenger is our goal in life. But it should be something that is constantly played in our minds in our day-to-day -day lives and whom we should be placing first in our decision making, in transactions, in our relationships, in our communication with others. Am I obeying Allah and his messenger or am I obeying my whims and desires or other human beings at the expense of the obedience of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, no doubt. But what is interesting about Fatima bint al-Hasan is the following, that the sixth holy Imam says, كانت صديقة. She was known as a صديقة. لم يرى في آل الحسن مثلها. There was no one from the children of Imam Al Hasan who was like her. Also found in Al Kafi. 
Very fascinating uh, uh, hadith from the sixth holy Imam. Imam says what? Imam says Fatima bint al Hassan displayed a quality that the Quran ascribes towards the likes of Maryam. Siddiqa is not the same as Sadiqa. Siddiqa is a higher status. What does it mean? No doubt there is the emphasis to speak the truth. But a Siddiq not only utters words of righteousness and haqq, but they practice it, but they are advocates of it, but they are role models of it. They become the symbol of what Sidq in reality is. Yes? Today, there are many ways in which we measure human beings. Let me give you an example. Sometimes when a marriage proposal comes forward and people want to ask about a particular boy, for example, I get calls from some of the mu'mineen. They say, can I ask you, does he come to mosque? He's somebody who comes Juma. does he come on Thursday nights? It's a measure in some people's eyes that the person is righteous or religious or somebody who is good because they believe if they come to mosque, they must be good, isn't it? No doubt participation and coming to mosque and listening to majalis and actively taking part and engaging in ibadah collectively are all very good qualities. There is no doubt in that whatsoever. However, is this a measure of somebody's righteousness or not? Let me tell you why. Because there is a very important, authentic narration from the six Imam says, do not look at an individual's length of sajda or how long they pray in order to find out who they are. Look at whether they are trustful or truthful. Whether they are trustworthy or, and whether they are sadiq in their day-to-day -day actions. Because these qualities should be a reflection of their ibadah, should be a reflection of their, what? Of their association with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A sadiq is an individual who is truthful, what they say. A siddiq is somebody who is even more in terms of their daily transactions, in terms of their interactions, in terms of what they espouse, their values, their teachings in every aspect of life. Let me give you a day-to-day -day practice so that we can take away from this holy lady and the Ahlul Bayt who are all Siddiqeen in a manner that should impact us in our day-to-day -day lives when we deal with people and especially deal with non-Muslims. There is a myth, there is an unfortunate misconception that exists in the mindset of some people and that is what? And that is, I can cheat when it comes to non-believers. There are some who believe that maybe I can fabricate insurance forms. Maybe I can lie when it comes to certain government agencies. When we say to them, brother, sister, why are you doing this? They say, you know what? It's a non-Muslim. And we are told to be truthful with Muslims. Apparently, told is one of the biggest myths in the idea that people somehow, somewhere, heard this myth that should be incorporated in their day-to-day -day interactions. Whereas the reality is far from this false notion, no doubt, that we are told that a sadiq, an individual who truly understands and follows in the footsteps of these holy individuals, because the Quran describes them as such in chapter 9, verse 119, Ya amanu taqullaha wa kunu ma O you who believe, exhibit taqwa and be with the truthful. Whom the Ahlul Bayt are, isn't it? One of the key characteristics in this is to recognize that an individual must be truthful in, with every human being that they engage with, Muslim or non-Muslim. Deception, cheating, any form of hypocrisy and dichotomy in our relationship, in our statements, in our utterances is unacceptable. 
in the viewpoints of our maraja and within the sharia of the religion of Islam. And that's why you recognize that the quality of Siddiq is a quality that we should be seeking. And it is one that can be applied and can be incorporated into our own very existence. And the role of parents is key here. The role of parents in ensuring that the children are raised with the knowledge of understanding the devastating consequences of lying, cheating, and deception. And I tell you, most of it is to do with money. And I've seen families who are seemingly religious. When it comes to dispute with money, they'll swear. They will do whatever necessary and lie just so that they can gain some wealth at the expense of their religion, at the expense of their akhirah. And their hearts sometimes, unfortunately, become sealed with the love of this world and materialism. And what? They're not bothered that they're uttering false testimonies, for example. And this is where push comes to shove. This is where the realization, whether we are truly believers or not, comes at the forefront, no doubt. And that's why Fatima bint al-Hasan Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayha was a brilliant individual because Imam al-Sajjad would call her Siddiqa. Imam would himself refer to her as the Siddiqa. There's no doubt. And at the same time, she was a narrator of hadith. She was somebody whom today we are benefiting from because for example she was one of those who narrated the hadith and the story of the returning back of the son for Amir al-Mu'mineen when the Prophet of Islam had his lap uh, had his head on the lap of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Amir al-Mu'mineen did not wish to wake him up because he had not uh, performed Salatul Asr and the sun had set and when the Prophet of Islam would then wake up and Imam Ali Salam would say to him that I have not performed Salatul Asr. And according to Sunni and Shia narrations, the Prophet of Islam supplicates to the Almighty and says, Allahumma rudda shams li Ali. Ya Allah, return back the sun for Ali ibn Abi Talib. And of course the sun immediately was visible and seen by the people miraculously after it had set and Amir al muminin performs his salah. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he finishes his salah, the sun sets back again. And this is a mosque that is found today in Medina, known as Masjid Radd al-Shams, known by the followers of Ali Muhammad. The name has been changed, but the mosque still exists in honor of this particular karama, this blessing from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the commander of the faithful. But arguably amongst the most difficult and the most testing time for Fatima bint al-Hasan radhwanullahi ta'ala alayha was her presence where in the land of Karbala and her witnessing of the tragedies. Not only did she witness the massacre on the 10th of Muharram but also had to endure what followed after. She was amongst the captives. Imam al-Baqir was three years of age she had to be an individual who was what? Who was supportive of Imam al-Baqir as well as her husband, Imam Zain al-Abideen. No doubt. I ask you, this lady that was indeed schooled under these uh, four Imams, no doubt. These four Imams from her father al-Mujtaba, from her husband al-Sajjad, from her son al-Baqir, and from her grandson al-Sadiq, what lessons would this particular lady incorporate into her own life? Especially as the fact that, of course, her husband Zain al Abidin would be reforming the souls of people through these wonderful lines of supplication and dua, awakening their conscience, no doubt. Yes? And indeed, this lady witnessed one calamity after calamity. The Siddiqa Fatima bint al-Hasan should be remembered as a person who endured so much suffering. And this name Fatima and this name Siddiqa was also of course originally one given to her grandmother, Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra. And I tell you when the name Fatima is mentioned before the Ahl al-Bayt, something happens to their hearts something occurs to their emotion. Narration after narration tell us of how they reacted when the name Fatima is uttered before them. Imam As-Sadiq one day was visited by somebody whom looked quite visibly upset. 
An Imam said to him, why are you upset? He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I have been told that my wife has just given birth to a young baby girl. So Imam looked at him and says, what have you named this baby girl? This man said, I've named her Fatima. The moment he said Fatima, the narrations tell us Imam al-Sadiq broke down in tears. He started to cry. And that man was surprised. Have I said anything? Why are you crying, Ya Ibn Rasulullah? What have I mentioned? But the Imam answers him in a different way. He looks up towards him and says, Now that you've named your daughter Fatima, I ask you, do not ever hurt her. Do not ever injure her. Then he said a line that reflects about the pain of Ja'far al-Sadiq. He said, never strike your daughter in her face. Do not slap your daughter, please. Don't slap your daughter. Imam al-Riva, when he was being told about the 10th of Muharram through eulogies and described through poetry what happened on the plains of Karbala, the poet then immediately refers to Fatima. Fatima, I wish you were there on the 10th of Muharram to see Hussein. The narration says to us that was the moment that Imam al Rida fell unconscious on the ground. When the name Fatima was mentioned, when it was uttered alongside the name of Hussein. I ask you, come to Karbala and see how Aba Abdullah reacted when the name Fatima was mentioned. What did he do when he heard the beloved name of his mother Fatima to Zahra? He was marching towards the battlefield. He was on his horse, determined to fight in the way of God. And then he heard his beloved sister Zainab call out, Mahlan Mahla, Yabna Zahra. Oh, the son of Fatima, come back, come back. When he heard the name of his beloved mother, Hussein had no choice but to return. He returned back. He looks at Zainab. Zainab is looking at him for the final time. She asks him something. Oh, brother Hussein, dismount from your horse. Aba Abdullah does this. But the moment he dismounts from the horse, imagine what the heart of Hussein was going through. Imagine his feelings. Zainab is asking him to come down from the horse. He's wondering, I've just bid farewell to my Zainab. I've just told her that I'm going. What is she doing? Then Zainab asks for more. She says, Akhi ya Hussein, come next to me. Aba Abdullah walks next to his Zainab. Then she, she says to him, Aba Abdullah, let me see your chest. Reveal to me your chest. Let me feel your neck. Hussein exposes his chest to his sister Zainab. She does something that breaks the heart of the Ahl al Bayt. She comes and embraces the chest of Hussein. Then she kisses the neck of Aba Abdullah. Then looks towards Medina. She says, Assalamu alaik ya Ummah, ya Fatima. I have fulfilled what you have asked me to do. Imagine Aba Abdullah. He is the name Fatima to Zahra. He comes back to Zainab. She says, Come down. He reveals his chest. He sees Zainab kisses his chest, embraces his neck, but all this, now he hears Zainab saying, Oh Fatima, I have done what you have asked me to do. He breaks down. Oh Zainab, why have you done this? Explain to me why have you done this? Zainab says, Akhi ya Hussein, I was amongst the last to see our mother Fatima. She looked at me and says, Daughter Zainab, you will be the last to see my Hussein. I ask you to embrace his chest. I ask you to kiss his neck for me. This is what I want you to do for me. Do this for your mother Fatima. 
Why, O oh Mother Fatima, why the chest of Hussein? Uh, salam Allah on the chest of Aba Abdullah. You know what the 12th Imam says in Ziyara? He says in Ziyara to Nahiya al Muqaddasa, he says, My grandfather Hussein, I bear witness that the hooves of the horses trampled on you whilst you were still alive. Some of us think that Imam al Hussein's ribs were shattered after he was martyred. Imam al Mahdi says, How did you feel when the horses trampled on you and you were still alive? Oh, my grandfather Hussein, I wish I was there to protect you. When the hooves shattered your bones and then crushed your body even after your martyrdom. Imam Zain al-Abideen hears these cries, hears these noises. When he hears something breaking, he says to his auntie Zainab, why do I hear something breaking? It's like glass being shattered. Zainab says, Ya Zain al-Abideen. Umar ibn Sa'ad said to ten horsemen, trample on the body body of Hussein. Break the ribs of Hussein. Dig your heels on the chest of Hussein. I say to her, O oh Zainab, you felt and you heard the breaking of the ribs of Hussein, but it wasn't the only ribs you saw being breaked. You were there when the ribs of your mother were broken between the wall and the door. You heard your mother Fatima cry out, Ya Rasulallah, my muhsin has gone, my ribs have been broken, I have been slapped and I have been with. Ala la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimi. Wa sayya'lamu al-lazheen zalamu ayya man qalabin yanqalibun. Wa la'aqibatu lil-muttaqeen wa inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these nights, ayyam fatimiya, to raise us with these holy ladies, Sayyidatul Nisa Fatima, and all those righteous individuals named as Fatima, such as Fatima bint Asad, Fatima Umm al Banin, Fatima bint al Hassan, and Fatima al Ma'suma in Qum. Ya Allah, raise us with all these holy ladies on the day of Qiyamah. Ya Allah, accept our deeds, accept our tears and aza for this holy lady of light. Ya Allah, enable us to visit the shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt. Enable us to protect the shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam and make us of his devout and sincere followers. Ma'atami Hussein. Ya Hussein.